Yo dogs, today we're going to continue looking at the philosophy of dreaming. Uh, we ended the last video by considering a theory from Jonathan Ichikawa that dreams are not hallucinations, rather they are uh, constructed out of mental imagery, like the imagery you have when you imagine objects. Uh, now, uh, there are some quite obvious problems with this theory. Uh, so, I mentioned in the, in the last video that hallucinations are very rare in daily life. Um, you know, and that, that's sort of one reason to, to favour Ichikawa's view. But is this, is this true? Right? Are hallucinations actually so rare? Well, here's my own experience. I don't know how common this is, but this is the case for me. When I'm drifting off to sleep, I, I often imagine things. I imagine uh, voices, people talking. Uh, so to begin with, this is certainly mental imagery, right? I'm imagining the voices. But then as I get near sleep, there's a quite palpable shift from mental imagery to outright hallucination. Suddenly, one of the voices will sound real. This also happens to a much more limited extent with visual imagery. Uh, so I will sometimes have very simple hallucinations, uh, visual hallucinations, as I'm drifting off to sleep. Uh, occasionally, the hallucination actually wakes me up. So I, I, I'm very sensitive to strobe lighting. Uh, fast flickering lights make me feel quite ill. I remember once I was drifting off to sleep and I could see a light slowly moving around like a lighthouse, but it got quicker and quicker and eventually it, it jolted me awake because it had it had become a, a strobe light. The point is that actually we know that there really are hallucinations surrounding sleep. Hallucinations that occur before sleep are known as hypnagogic hallucinations Hallucinations that occur as you are waking up are known as hypnopompic hallucinations. And sometimes these can be very powerful. Sleep paralysis is a uh, very disturbing kind of hallucination where the person wakes up unable to move. Um, I think this, this is because that when you go to sleep, your body becomes paralysed. Uh, that's what stops you from sleepwalking. But in some cases, people can wake up and yet the paralysis remains. Uh, sleep paralysis often comes with very powerful and frightening hallucinations. People will see monsters in their room, they will hear demonic voices, they will feel a weight on their chest, uh, they might feel like they can't breathe. Probably many of the stories uh, of people being abducted by aliens or of being visited by ghosts or demons uh, come from experiences of sleep paralysis. It, it really is a very powerful uh, and disturbing experience. I used to get sleep paralysis all the time, sometimes several times a night. For me, it was always auditory hallucinations. I would sort of hear these uh, evil voices and growls and things like that. Very unpleasant. Now, sleep paralysis is unquestionably a hallucination. Um, of course, we could argue that dreams are different, but since we know that there are hallucinations when drifting into sleep and when waking up, it's it's not much of a stretch to say that there are hallucinations during sleep as well. Uh, the question is, why would you have hallucinations surrounding dreams, but the dreams themselves are something completely different? I mean, it, it actually seems quite natural to, uh, to say that dreams are hallucinations. Another problem is that if dreams are constructed from imagery, why do they cause such powerful emotional reactions? Dreams can involve in feelings of intense embarrassment, like if you have a dream where you're out in public and you realise you forgot to put your clothes on, or intense fear, uh, nightmares are very common, or great happiness and joy, you might dream that you've won the lottery. Now the question is, how can imagery cause emotions like this? If you imagine a monster, even a really scary monster, you don't respond with extreme fear. Similarly, I don't feel joy just by imagining that I've won the lottery. The problem here is that imagery doesn't lead to belief, and belief is necessary for emotional response. If I hallucinate an aggressive dog, that will cause me to believe that there is an aggressive dog near me, and this belief is what causes my fear. On the other hand, merely imagining an aggressive dog, whether I've uh, intentionally imagined it, uh, or if the image comes to my mind involuntarily, this doesn't lead to the belief that I'm facing an aggressive dog, so there's nothing to be afraid of. So, uh, what might we say about this? Well, I think there's actually a pretty plausible response to this, which is that 
um, actually belief isn't necessary for emotional response. We often have emotional responses to fictions. When you watch a film or read a book, you know that it isn't real, but it still leads to emotions. Books are actually a very good analogy here because books prompt mental imagery. So when you read a book and get scared, what's causing that emotion seems to be the mental imagery that it creates. Um, I mean, actually, there are a lot of philosophical questions about emotional responses to fiction. Uh, and I have a, a video called uh, Philosophy of Art, Paradox of Fiction, which discusses these problems if you're interested. But for this video, it's enough to note that in the right circumstances, we do respond to mere mental imagery. When that mental imagery is, uh, I guess, combined with the right kind of story. So uh, it, it really isn't so... so odd then that imagery, if, if dreams are, made, are created from mental imagery, that they would cause powerful emotions. The other problem for Ichikawa is why exactly do we assume that dreams involve hallucinations? Why, when we remember our dreams, do we picture them as being hallucinatory? I mean, if, if in fact they're nothing like hallucinations, why do we remember them that way? Uh, Daniel Dennett has an easy explanation for our assumption that dreams are uh, that, that we remember dreams as hallucinatory, then it says that they're simply false memories. We don't experience anything when we sleep, but when we wake up, we have false narratives inserted into our memories. Now, Ishikawa can't appeal to this explanation, because Ishikawa accepts that we really do have dream experiences. When I say that I remember dreaming that I robbed a bank, uh, it's, it's likely that I really did have the experience of robbing the bank in, in a dream. So why then, if we, if we do in fact remember our dreams and they're not just completely false memories, why are we so mistaken about the nature of dreams? Now there are two uh, ways to respond to this, I think. Um, and in fact, these two points maybe answer the other objections as well. First, there is good psychological evidence that people tend to confuse mental imagery with percepts. This was found in a study by C.W. Perky called An Experimental Study of Imagination. In this study, Perky asked her subjects to fixate on a screen in front of them and imagine seeing various objects there. So she might, uh, she might say, OK, look at this screen and imagine seeing a banana on the screen. She then projected an image of the banana onto the screen very, very faintly, just above the normal visibility threshold. None of the subjects realised that they were act that they were in fact seeing the images. All of the subjects assumed that they were just imagining an image, when in fact they were really seeing it. And we know that many of the subjects did see the projection because it influenced what the way they um, imagined the image, the the object. Uh, so one person reported being surprised that he imagined the banana upright, because he'd been trying to imagine a banana laying down. Um, Obviously, the image that Perky projected was, not, was of an upright banana. So this guy tried. So this guy fixated on the screen, imagined a banana, and he started imagining the banana laying down. Uh, but then he ended up instead. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm imagining an upright banana instead. That's a bit of a surprise. He assumed he was just imagining it, but in fact, he was seeing the image of an upright banana. So we can confuse mental imagery with, with percepts very easily. In a later study by S.J. Siegel, titled Assimilation of a Stimulus in the Construction of an Image, she asked subjects to visualise seeing the New York skyline. Stare at a screen, visualise New York skyline. She then projected an unrelated image, such as the image of a tomato. Again, the subjects failed to notice these projections, but they would assimilate the projection into what they were imagining. For example, if they were asked to imagine New York, and then they had the projection of the tomato, the subject would say, I, I imagined seeing New York at sunset with a big red sun coming down in the sky. So, you know, it, it looks like then that actually it is easy to confuse mental imagery with, with percepts. We, we can confuse imagery with either perception or hallucination. And perhaps this helps explain why we, don't, we fail to realise that dreams are merely images. Uh, especially since during a dream, we're, we're going to be in an altered, often lesser state of consciousness. Indeed, perhaps even 
the hallucinations that we seem to have before and after sleep. Maybe they're not really hallucinations. Maybe that's, again, imagery. But it's just that in a uh, drowsy and semi-delirious state, we don't realise this. A second response is to say that while it's true that we do remember our dreams, uh, and yeah, we also remember other experiences like sleep paralysis, our memories for these things are extremely bad. Memories of dreams are often fabricated and easily susceptible to influences based on our expectations. Dream reports are not accurate and shouldn't be taken at face value. So we seem to remember dreams uh, and other sleep-related experiences as involving hallucinations, but actually they didn't. We assume that they did because our memories lead us astray. Now at this point I'd actually like to expand on this qu quite a bit more in this video. Uh, so this point is that you know, the, the question here is how accurate are dream reports? We tend to assume that dream reports are basically accurate. Uh, although we often forget what, what happens in many of our dreams, we assume that the bits that we do remember really did happen. And they really did happen in the way that we remember them happening. So that's the standard view. Uh, dream memories are basically accurate. Uh, Ishikawa would certainly want to resist this. And I think there is perhaps uh, good reason to resist it, arguably. Uh, Melanie Rosen, although Melanie Rosen accepts that we do have dream experiences, she argues for the claim that a substantial portion of dream memories are completely fabricated and, and we really shouldn't trust our memories of dreams. There are a number of factors that we should expect uh, can lead to the fabrication of dream reports. I mean, I mean, the first point here is to you have to bear in mind that even in waking life, memory is uh, is often subject to revision. Uh, the, the the unreliability of memory, even for real events, is very well established in psychology. Uh, look up the work of Elizabeth Loftus if you're interested in this. In one famous study uh, by her and Jacqueline Pickrell, they gave subjects four stories stories which purportedly described events in the subject's childhood. Uh, the, the, the stories had been provided by relatives. Now, three of the stories were true, but the fourth was fictional. After reading the stories, subjects were told to write down anything else they remembered about the incident. About one third of subjects claimed to remember the false incident and could even uh, provide further details about it. Uh, for example, one subject called Chris was given the, the following story, completely made up. When you were five, you got lost in a toy store, you were crying a lot, and then you were rescued by an elderly man and reunited with your family. Chris claimed to remember this event, and he provided various details about what the toy store looked like. He described some of his thoughts and feelings at the time. He said that the man who rescued him wore a blue flannel shirt and was bald with glasses. Uh, when Chris was told that one of the four memories uh, he just talked about was actually fictional, uh, and he was asked to guess which one, he selected the wrong memory. So he, he, he thought, even when he was told one of these memories is fictional, he still thought that the, the, the story about him being rescued after getting lost in a toy store was a, a true memory. So, so memory in general is, is untrustworthy in many contexts, and we should expect that dreams are especially susceptible to uh, memory fabrication for, for various reasons. First, there is simply a rapid memory loss of dreams, and this is something we're all familiar with. We often forget most of what we dreamed, and sometimes we have to work very hard to recall dream events. But here's, I mean, I guess this is one sort of uh, point where Melanie Rosen will uh, raise a sceptical problem. When we work to try to remember our dreams, are we actually uh, looking through our memory bank, as it were, finding what actually happened? Or are we merely unconsciously constructing a wholly false memory? Uh, what, what Rosen suggests is that when we wake up, we remember a few snatches of a narrative, and then we fill in the gaps with uh, false constructed memories. I might wake up and remember uh, dreaming of being in a boat, and then I remember uh, being on a beach and I'm all wet. And that's all. That's all I initially remember. And I think, well, what else happened in that dream? And after thinking about it, I remember, oh, the boat capsized and I had to swim to shore. Rosen suggests that this is completely untrustworthy. It's There's a good chance that the capsizing and swimming to shore was just a, a fabrication to fill the gap. Uh, a second 
problem for dreams is that anything can happen in dreams. And this means that the normal memory cues are lost. Suppose you ask me, what did I do one hour ago? Well, I know that I ate some cereal an hour ago. This must have involved walking out of my room, going downstairs, going to the kitchen, getting a bowl out of the cupboard, opening the uh, fridge, getting the milk out, and so on. Or if I know, okay, I went to the supermarket an hour ago, that must have involved going outside, getting go, going into the car, driving, and so on. Or if I know that I was at a university lecture, uh, that must mean I was away from home at the university campus, etc. The point is that in real life, if you know that you did X, then immediately you know that you did A, B, C, D, E as well. This is not the case for dreams. If I eat cereal in a dream, maybe the cereal just appeared in front of me, or maybe it was carried to me by a flying elephant, or maybe uh, my house is completely different, uh, and it's actually a big Gothic mansion with loads of servants in the kitchens. So when you remember a dream, you can't use one event as a cue to remember other events, or at least if you do, that cue is not gonna be reliable. When you awake and you, you, you rapidly lose memory of a dream, your brain will probably appeal to normal cues to fill the gaps, but this is likely to lead it astray. So in, with the example of you know being in a, in a boat and um, then finding myself on the shore, well, the brain just fills the gap with swimming to shore because that's what you have to do if a boat capsizes. But in, in a dream, in fact, the boat might capsize and then you just immediately appear on the shore. There's nothing to, there's no reason why that shouldn't have happened. It's not just that normal memory cues are lost, of course, dreams, involve extremely bizarre events or strange narrative structures or things can be distorted in strange ways or there can just be gaps in the narrative and Rosen thinks it's likely that when we wait as we wake up we rationalize these events we we smooth out the weirdness or maybe we exaggerate the weirdness we focus on a few strange events and exaggerate them and then fit them into a mostly constructed narrative uh, I get I mean there, there are two sort of memory processes at work here first there's the tendency we have to favour linear narratives, which means that dreams that are distorted and confused with gaps in the narrative, these dreams will be smoothed out in memory, they'll be made coherent. Second, we have a tendency to focus on surprising events. Dreams may involve very routine events, but if a monster turns up, the me memory will fixate on that, and then it will kind of build a narrative around that surprising event. The psychologist David Foulkes has found evidence that fabrication does in fact happen. Uh, he divided subjects into two groups. Some were woken up in the middle of uh, REM sleep. The others were allowed to go through REM sleep and wake up naturally. Uh, these uh, Both groups were then asked to report their dreams. The dream reports given after waking up naturally featured far more rational narratives, more rational, coherent stories. Now, since the reports given in the middle of REM sleep are more immediate, we should expect them, they're presumably more accurate. Uh, what, what, what this evidence seems to show is that by merely sleeping a few more minutes, substantial memory is lost and the dream is rationalized and uh, sort of made more coherent. The strangeness of dreams even extends to your personality. In a dream, you might commit atrocities without any guilt uh, or, or, or even any awareness that you're causing suffering. Uh, you might have sex in public without any shame, you might be at a funeral laughing, laughing at the deceased's grieving family. There's a danger that when you awake, you will project, project normal feelings back onto the dream event. Returning to the Folk study, he also asked people uh, who gave dream reports after interrupted REM sleep to give reports of the same dreams uh, you know, later after they uh, had a bit more sleep. Uh, in, in one case, for example, a subject who was woken during REM sleep reported being chased but feeling no fear, which obviously is a bit strange, um, you know, having, having been chased by something and just not being afraid of it, but that was what they reported. In the later morning report, they described being afraid. So it looks like this subject uh, kind of rationalised the dream and the, the unconscious assumption was, uh, well, if I was being ch chased, I would have been afraid. So since he dreamt being chased, he fabricated the uh, feeling of fear, or he projected the fear sort of back onto the dream. There are then many reasons to think that dream memories are especially susceptible to fabrication, and that provides some uh, support for Melanie Rosen's uh, fabrication view. Now, there are a few other reasons to favour the fabrication thesis. 
First, the standard view fails to explain the lack of correlation between most eye movements and dream reports. I mentioned in the earlier video how eye movements often seem to track dream experiences, and sometimes in quite precise ways. So we saw the example of the, uh, the guy whose eyes sort of went vertically uh, in a particular pattern, and then he later reported dreaming seeing a girl somersault. But most eye movements are actually completely at odds with the dream reports. One simple explanation here is, well actually eye movements do always track dream experiences, but the later dream reports are largely uh, fabricated memories. Second, uh, the fabrication theory explains the suspense dreams that were described by Dennett. Uh, the suspense element is fabricated after waking. Remember uh, Maury's dream of taking part in the French Revolution leading up to being guillotined? when he, he woke to find the headboard of the bed falling onto his neck. Initially it looks as though the dream was building up to the event of the headboard fall, falling, but how could that be possible? Um, I mean, what, what, you know, do dreams have some sort of precognitive element? I mean, that seems unlikely. Well, uh, R Rosen's view provides uh, a perfectly plausible explanation. Uh, the headboard falling caused the hallucination of the guillotining at the end of the dream, and then almost all the rest of the dream was forgotten. The French Revolution narrative was fabricated in, in the memory, since we associate guillotines with the French Revolution. Uh, so yeah, the, we, the headboard fell, that caused the hallucination of the guillotining, um, and maybe the uh, dream before then was actually something completely unrelated. But, uh, he, uh, but the, uh, Maury then just forgot that and fabricated this new narrative to fit with the guillotining. Third, the fabrication uh, theory gets support from an interesting development in dream research. During the first half of the 20th century it was believed by most people uh, and by most psychologists that the majority of dreams, indeed possibly all dreams, are black and white. Numerous studies of uh, dream reports showed that people very rarely reported seeing any colour in their dreams. And if you directly asked people they would they would say that their dreams were, were had black and white imagery rather than coloured. Uh, Eric Schwitzgabel's article, Why Did We Think We Dreamed in Black and White, uh, contains a number of references here if you want to go and look that up. It's a good article. Uh, so, uh, in contrast, before the 20th century, people assumed that dreams were coloured. We can find talk of coloured dreams in Aristotle and Descartes, for example. And from about the 1960s onward, uh, the opinion of pr both professional psychologists and the layperson uh, again became more open to colour in dreams uh, and of course today I think we, we all assume that dreams are coloured. Now the prevalence of black and white dreaming uh, during the uh, early 1900s is, is curious, right? So Schwitzgabel asks what explains it? Why did people during this time report dreaming mostly in black and white? Well one part of the answer is surely the prevalence of black and white media most photographs were black and white. Colour photography was invented in the 1860s, but it, it only really became widely used in the 1940s. Cinema and television were uh, very popular in the 20th century, but almost all films and TV shows were black and white until the 1950s. Surely it's no coincidence that black and white dreaming reports coincided with uh, black and white media. But there's still a question about what exactly the relation between these phenomena is. And there are really four possibilities. So the most obvious explanation is that uh, black and white media caused black and white dreaming. People before the 20th century dreamed mostly in colour. Then when black and white films and TV shows became popular, dream experiences literally changed and the dreams became drained of colour. Then when colour made its way into popular media, dreaming changed again, back to coloured dreaming. But Schwitzgabel points out there's an obvious problem with this. Most dreams are not modelled on films or photographs. I dream of my house or my girlfriend or of taking a walk in the woods or of being back in my old school or I, uh, maybe I, I dream of uh, working in a chop chip shop that, I was, that I'd visited the day before. Wh whatever, you know, I mean, it, all of these things, all of the things that we experience in real life are seen in colour. Um... And, and obviously even when black and white media was popular, the vast majority of a person's visual experiences were coloured. That's just the way we see the world. Uh, similarly suggestive is, is blind people. People who are blind from birth 
Uh, obviously, they don't report any visual sensations in their dreams. Um, but it, it seems that uh, people who become blind later in life do still have visual dreams. Uh, probably the number of visual dreams declines somewhat the longer you're blind. But what this shows is that the character of your daily experiences doesn't necessarily alter the character of your dreams. Uh, so a person who becomes blind still has uh, visual sensations in their dreams, which means that you know, just because you're watching a uh, black and white film or a black and white TV show, you know, why, why would that necessarily make your dreams black and white? So what Schwitzgable suggests is that maybe it's not that the dreams themselves change, rather the reporting and the memory of dreams changed. And that leaves us with three options. Uh, so second, maybe dreams have always been black and white, and people prior to the 20th century and after the 1960s uh, are just mistaken. We think they're coloured, we're just wrong. Third, dreams have always been coloured, and people of the uh, early 1900s were mistaken in reporting them as black and white. Finally, uh, dreams are neither coloured nor black and white. This would be Jonathan Ichikawa's view, since dreams, on his view, are constructed not out of hallucinations, but out of mental imagery. And I assume that mental imagery has no particular colours, not even black and white. If you ask someone to imagine a tree, uh, they, they might imagine a tree, but without any particular colour. Um, but neither would it be right to say that they're imagining a black and white tree. There's just no fact of the matter. Uh, I mean, of course, if you ask them to name a colour, then then they'll add a colour to the image. But the, the point is that much of what we imagine just ha just is indeterminate what the colour is. Uh, it's, so it's neither coloured nor black and white. Now, whichever of these uh, three views we accept, if we reject this first view and accept one of these three views, then we're forced to say that most people can be completely mistaken about a central aspect of their dreams. If we think that dreams are coloured and have always been coloured, which is, I guess, the most plausible of, the most initially uh, intuitive of these three options, if we say that, uh, then people in, in the past missed a significant part. They were significantly mistaken about a very important aspect of dream experience. People in the past falsely reconstructed their dreams in black and white. But, you know, I mean, of course, the, the sceptical point here is if people could be so wrong about something so important in the past, then we immediately get scepticism of our own dream reporting. Presumably many of our own dream reports can also be completely wrong. So so this perhaps supports the, uh, the, the fabrication thesis, uh, the fabrication theory. Uh, if, if we reject this first option and we hold that uh, the nature of dreams didn't change, it's just the reporting of dreams changed, then then that would provide some pretty good evidence that dream memories are very unreliable. Okay, well, uh, the last couple of videos, really the aim has been to present some, some challenges to the orthodox view of dream experience. And this is the view that, uh, that we have experiences during at least some of the time we sleep, that's, that these experiences are sensory hallucinations, and that reports of these experiences are generally accurate. Um, I mean, I, I find, uh, I, I think that I would say that we pretty clearly do have dreams. We do have experiences when we sleep, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that those, they are hallucinations. I don't really buy Ichikawa's view. But I think that, uh, that the points about the unreliability of dream memory are quite plausible. Um, so who knows, maybe uh, we, we just can be completely mistaken about many of our, our dreams. Uh, but anyway, I hope that's given you something to think about. And uh, that's all for this uh, for, for now. Goodbye.